Welcome to Grand Sumo Breakdown, the unofficial sumo podcast for official sumo fans. Welcome to Grand Sumo Breakdown. This is Ryan. This is Jake. This is Flerk. This is Mac. And I'll just let Jake take it away. Uh, we are doing a special episode on the 54th Yokozuna, Wajima, uh, who passed away recently. We're just going to do a quick overview of his uh, of his career and uh, some of the more interesting things about this guy because he was quite a character. Like many younger, newer sumo fans, I hadn't heard this name before until he actually did pass away. Uh, that was on October 8th of 2018. Uh, I didn't really know who he was, but we thought we would do a little bit of research and you know see see what kind of a what kind of a wrestler he was, what kind of accomplishments he had, and things like that. Just you know, Yokozuna is a pretty rare thing. We've only had seventy some of them ever, so when one passes away, that's a big deal. And thought it would be worth looking into. Um, and there is a lot on this guy. Uh, I mean, out of out of the Yokozuna that um, that we've had in the twentieth century. He's probably one of the more interesting ones to read about. He was uh, he had a lot of unconventional uh, tendencies, stories, even some scandals, just because that's kind of how it always ends up. This kind of remind me of Asashoryu a little bit. Uh, I'll, when we do an Asashoryu episode, I bet you it's going to be the exact same intro, except <laughs> for like he's not he didn't die. You Hopefully. Know? <laughs> Hopefully he didn't. Yeah. Die. yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hopefully we get to Asa Shoryu before he dies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Okay, well, let's start with the basics here. He was born uh, in 1948. He was born in the Ishikawa Prefecture of Japan uh, and always maintained his ties to his home city, his home prefecture. Um, and there are some current, uh, excuse me, current Sekitori uh, who still pay homage to him by wearing gold mawashis. That was one of the things that uh, oh. Wajima was known for. Oh. Uh, so. Can you pick two of them? Kageyaki. Kageyaki. Endo. Endo. That's it. Those yeah. are the two current guys. Um, well, I, I can't say that there are no other uh, wrestlers from that area, but those two specifically wear gold and uh, hail from the same uh, same region of Japan. That's pretty cool. Uh, in his uh, childhood, obviously was very interested in sumo. In university, he was the University of Yokozuna, 1968 and 1969. So he elected not to go into sumo directly then. So he Correct. chose okay. He chose uh, he chose to go to Nihon University rather than enter sumo at the minimum age. Uh, by becoming the University of Yokozuna, especially by becoming Yokozuna twice in a row, uh, he was able to skip quite a bit of the uh, early bit of sumo uh, the sumo career, and he jumped right into Makushita sixty um, in his very first professional tournament. Uh, we've seen guys like Mitaki Yumi recently did that. That's you know it's. People who go to college are are taking time that they could have been wrestling, but if they're extremely successful, the any uh, the sumo association allows them to kind of jump the line a little bit to make up for their uh, accomplishments. Now we noticed Jake that in the Bonds K listing, he had a strange designation next to his ranking of OB. What does that mean? I'm not positive what it stands for, but it uh, it's indicating that he jumped the line there that okay. he was making his mm. debut at that rank. Uh, but yeah, he rocketed right up the ranks. Um, let me bring this up. He, he won his first two Makushita Basho, uh, seven and zero. So he was in Jurio in his third Basho ever. <laughs> oh, wow. Dang. Uh, he spent four total tournaments in Jurio and that was the last he ever saw of that division. <laughs> Holy So cow. one year up to Maegashira and never <laughs> looked back. Exactly. <laughs> and he, you said he was 1969 was his second year in university. So he would have only been like 21 or 22 yep. at this point. He made his, his debut was at age 22 in January of 1970. So 23 Maegashira never looked back. Yep. Pretty much. Um, wow. So yeah, kind of the the Takakesho comparison. You know that he's he's one of the guys that Takakesho can get compared to as far as like, you know he's he's at that rank at such a young age. Um, and one more year later, uh, we have Wajima at Komasubi. Jeez. One more year later, he is at Ozeki, but, and he spent a total of four tournaments at Ozeki <laughs> before his promotion up to Yokozuna. Yes. Three, three and a half years is all it took from him to go to from mid Makushita to Yokozuna with uh, with two tournaments under his belt already. I, the the comparisons to uh, Takakesho is it's kind of sticking with my head. Kind of optimistic I, now, isn't it? I, I was gonna say <laughs> let's pull this open. So like he spent like a year. He did, definitely didn't 
he spent like a year or so in. Oh, he started all the way down at Myzuma. Okay, so that's one big difference. Oh yeah, yeah. Taka Keisho yeah. didn't have the same the the same college experience to give him that that head start. Mm-hmm. I, I just bring it up because uh, their their age is similar. Yeah, uh, yeah. when I, they were getting to the top, he spent about a year in, in Jurio, or about four Bashos, give or take. We're talking about Wajima. I, I'm talking about Taka Keisho. Oh, right now. okay. Yeah. Okay, so then he spent one, two, three, four, five, six, a whole year in the uh, Makushi ranks till he hit Komasubi. Mikashiro ranks till he hit Komosubi. Thank you. So same as Wajima. Yeah. Uh, he jumped down to uh, make that's sure. Where Mike the, that's where the difference is going to kind of right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's Jump a little up. bit of a difference here because Takakesha's got some Makakoshi sprinkled in there. Wajima, you know, three ever in his entire <laughs> career. <laughs> okay. Makakoshis. That's, yeah, so, like yeah. His, his, I, I only brought it up because of the age. Wajima yeah. was quite yeah. the phenom. I will say, I will say so the, it, since he hit Sanyaku, it's been about a year in the Basho or so. So it's he's kind of on pace, but a little bit slower. So yeah, well, we'll see how it turns out for for him. But uh, yeah, there, this is a pretty high bar. Yeah, was he a bigger guy, was, or was he about Takakesho's build, or are we talking a Kaise and Ichinojo? By, by this point, he really wasn't even done growing. But <laughs> <laughs> true, but <laughs> um, but yeah, his his overall like career numbers that they give are uh, six foot one and one hundred and thirty kilos, or two hundred and eighty seven pounds. Not very big. No, not big at all. <laughs> Uh, you mentioned that he only had three career Make Koshis. That's not counting Yokozuna injury pullouts, but yeah. Right, and I wasn't included. Oh, there it is, Jurio. He had a 7-8 in Jurio. Yep. So his fourth Basho, Make Koshi, 7-8. and eight. His second Maegashira Basho, 5-10. and 10. His fourth Maegashira Basho, 6-9. and nine. After that, unless he was injured, he had a winning record. Yep, so the the first Megashira... He, he started out at Megashira 11 and did uh, did okay. Uh, he got bumped up to Megashira five in his second uh, Makuuchi tournament. Went five and ten, not uncommon, you know. Like most guys by now would have had that big step up and terrible performance kind mm-hmm. of thing. He had that one time. Went back down to Megashira twelve. Great performance up to Megashira two. His first time in the joy. Went six and nine, and then ever since then, yeah, that's when it just clicked, and he was done losing ever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so yeah, at about two and a half years into his career, he got his first, uh, his first U show at Sekiwake and a year later he went 15 and 0 as an Ozeki after four consecutive June U shows. Uh, Whoa. so that was the equivalent, uh, to bump him up to Yokozuna where he won 12 more over the course of about, uh, eight years or so. Uh, he, yeah, so he, he didn't have the longest <laughs> career, only about 11 years, but I mean that because of the time in university that put him at about 33 or so, you know, about, about where we might expect guys to start declining about as long as Hakuho has been Yokozuna, give or take. Eh. <laughs> um, but yeah, so why, why don't we go back a, a little bit here to the, the beginning of his career? Um, he, he joined a uh, Hanakago stable. He was pretty heavily recruited uh, because of that university status. Um, and uh, I mean, we covered some of his early tournaments here, but, um, he, he made Sekiwaki very, very early and got that you show. Um, he, he was like, like I've been saying, he, he was a phenom. It was never really in doubt that he was going to be a huge deal. It was just a matter of how long would it take him to get up there. His Ozeki run, since, uh, we are recording this in, um, uh, February, 2019, in case, you know, people are coming back to listen to this later. We're kind of in the midst of Takakesho and Tamawashi being in that Ozeki conversation. Um, but yeah, it really wasn't much in doubt for uh, Wajima. Um, he had a Yusho, then he had a 12 and 3, an 8 and 7, and a 13 and 2. Uh, one of those being a Yusho, one of them being a Jun Yusho, and two of them with special prizes. That's 33 wins, the same amount of wins that Takakesho just did not get. Um, yeah, that's true. The Ozeki promotion with. And he also had a Yusho and a Jun Yusho, the same as Wajima. Well, Wajima had uh, a number of victories over over top ranked guys in a more apparently in a, in a more consistent way that uh, was you know better for the the deliberation councils. Yeah, he also had three Bashos as Sekiwake and stuck around. <laughs> yeah, that that is yeah. a big big thing. Mm-hmm. I think that does play a part in it. Yeah, Ooh. so he got four four consecutive Bashos at Sekiwake before that promotion. We've done enough complaining about Takakesho not getting that Oseki promotion. <laughs> I, I think we. I don't know if this episode's going <laughs> to age very well <laughs> yeah. compared to other history ones. Who were the active Yokozuna that he had to face? Um, let me bring that up. This is in uh, the early seventies. So there, um, Chiyo no Fuji. Uh, no, not yet. Chiyo no Fuji was 80s? in the early eighties. Okay. Yeah. Um, Ooh, just one. Uh, Kita no Fuji was one of the guys that he had to face. It looks like that might be the only mm. the only one that he faced in this 
in this Ozeki run, at least. Yeah, it looks like Kita no Fuji. Uh, some of the other greats uh, that he was also being compared to along this time here is uh, Takanohana, uh, the, the father of the Takanohana that we know, um, mm. who was a legendary Ozeki. Um, th- those Wajima and the first Takanohana, they kind of came up together. They were longtime rivals, and they were both promoted to Ozeki at the same time, actually. Mm. Also looks like Kita no Umi, the 55th Yokozuna, so promoted right after Wajima, yep. was at the same time. And Kita no Umi is one of the top. One of the top ever. Yokozuna yeah, ever. He, was, he was like in the conversation. Kita no Umi was, uh, he was like second only to Taiho until Chiyo no Fuji came around in the 80s. So Kita no Umi, even though he was a little bit younger, a little bit uh, further back in the, uh, the progression than Wajima, th- those two are the, the rivalry that kind of define each other. So o- over their entire career, uh, Wajima did get the better of him. They went 23 and 21 in favor of Wajima over the course of their careers. Very nice and even. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. It, it was kind of uh, Wajima early and Kitano, Kitanoomi as their careers went on. Kitanoomi had a little bit more longevity to him, uh, but they were definitely the, the main rival of each other during, that, during the 70s here. But yeah, so some of the other things that happened along the these the the seventies here, he was the first wrestler, and as far as my research uh, can find, the only wrestler to ever win a U show with an absence on their record. So huh? he, wait, whoa, whoa, what do you mean? So he he went twelve two and one, which was enough to win the U show in November of nineteen seventy three. He was he was facing Takanohana on day twelve, and he split the webbing between his fingers. Ow. I don't Ow. know anything more about this injury than that one sentence. I don't want to know. It's the worst sentence I've ever read. <laughs> Ow. Ow. Yeah. So either way that was, he, he got some stitches and he tried to compete, but he couldn't do it. Did so he win that match uh, afterwards? No. Okay. He was, he was 12 and 0, and then he went 12 and one by losing a match. And then his, the other two guys that were in the running also lost, so he was far enough ahead. He just said, screw it. <laughs> okay. So he sat out day 14 and 15. So one of those was a Kyujo loss, uh, or a Fusen loss, and the other one was an absence. I scrolled all the way back to the 70s in uh, the list of you show winners. I can't find anybody else that has an, as- an, uh, an absence on their record. I think this is a record that's probably going to uh, probably going to stay. I don't know. That, that's, that was crazy. I, I love that one, though. But uh, yeah, so it, this is if we're still talking the mid seventies, this is kind of his kind of his prime. Uh, between seventy three and seventy seven is when he won most of his most of his U shows, twelve of his fourteen total. Um, and then over seventy eight, seventy nine, and eighty, he he won two more, but he was kind of faltering. Uh, the injuries were piling up, and the absences were coming around. He won his final U show in November of nineteen eighty. Participated in one more. And then in March of 1981 is when he had to call it quits. Mm-hmm. He went one and two and said, you know what, that's, that's it. Kind of a Kisuno Sato situation. It was just like, you know what, this was my last go of it, but I'm just too injured. It's not worth it anymore. Yeah, so he, he was, uh, that 14 wins is kind of important. And a lot of people have paid tribute to that. Uh, Hakuho actually has been a, well, I mean, obviously not anymore because he passed away, but Hakuho was a, a good friend of Wajimo while, while he was alive. Akuho actually wore a gold Mawashi when he won his 14th Yusho in Wajima's honor. Wow. Yeah, cool. and like we mentioned earlier, Endo and Kagiyaki, they wear gold Mawashis uh, because they're from the same place. Kagiyaki is actually a distant relative of Wajima. Oh, cool. So Hakuho just knew, like, I'm going to win this Yusho, so I'm going to wear the <laughs> gold mo- Did he wear it for the entirety of the Basho, do you know, or was it just like the day where he... Oh, that it. that I can't say for sure. Okay. He may have he may have switched it. How I was going to say the balls on Hakuho <laughs> to just wear the gold. Like this is going to be my fourteenth U show. Don't worry about it. Ah. To be fair, that fourteenth U show that he won, that that four, his fourteenth U show was in the midst of his streak of seven in a row, four yeah. of which were fifteen and zero. <laughs> so he, yeah, he might as well have just said, yeah, screw it. Uh-huh. <laughs> Let's pay tribute for fifteen days. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if you, if you look it up, there's, um, the sumo forums actually have a great memoriam, uh, overview, uh, for Wajima with, with just like dozens of pictures of the guy. It's awesome. Uh, and it includes several of him with Hakuho, like hanging out in a hot tub, uh, <laughs> just like, you know, just hanging out, talking to the press. There's, there's a couple in a hot of, tub? 
In the hot tub. In the hot tub. <laughs> There's Hakuho on the dohyo. In the uh, hot tub. The, the hot tub dohyo wearing his gold mawashi. Nice. Yeah, it's really cool. So yeah, because they were because they were friends, that was one way that Hakuho decided he would pay tribute to the guy, and I I think that's super cool. Yeah. Um. But yeah. So that kind of covers uh the in the ring. Um. Oh, I- excuse me. There there's one more bit I wanted to cover uh, that I thought was pretty cool. His preferred grip was the Hidari Yatsu. That is the left hand inside grip. Uh, and because he was so strong with it and because of his Mawashi color, he was often referred to as the golden left. Was yeah. he left handed or right handed? Uh, I don't know, but he was <laughs> he had that. That was his preferred grip. No, it so it, it makes that. sense. It's just um, I'm curious. <laughs> yeah, that left hand inside, he was able to get tons of Shitate Nage's, the underarm throw. Uh, he also obviously did a lot of Yorikiri and Suri Dashi was another one of his common uh, Kimurite. That's the just full on brute force lifting people out which is pretty cool because he was not giant. He was, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. that's why I seem perplexed. I was like, wait a minute. Yeah. He wasn't that big. How did yeah. he manage that? Just I, leverage, I guess. Yeah. I, I doubt we'll be able to answer this on this episode, but this was kind of before the Americans came of where they you like really, really big. Not quite. Uh, Takamiyama was around during this time. Okay. Uh, I, so oh. I guess when I think of a huge Americans, I'm thinking of Akebono, Konishiki. Yeah. The, yeah. The Konishiki yeah, yeah that was later. After, yeah. And Musashi Maru. Yeah. Can't so forget, can't forget him. Yep. Uh, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I guess the point I'm trying to say is I'll be curious what the average uh, height and weight was around this. Sure. Time. Sure. Yeah. I, I, I couldn't tell you here off the top of my head, but it's, mm-hmm. um, it certainly has the average size has certainly increased since then. Uh, but that's, that's still always been like one of the, one of the famed mythical, awesome sumo techniques, you know, just manhandle your opponent yeah. off the ground and gently escort him out. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so the golden left, that was a, a nickname that stuck with him at his funeral. Uh, and this, oh, this was my favorite picture that I found in that sumo forums thread. We'll, we'll have to tweet it out then. Yeah, I, I think we should. There's, uh, pictures from his funeral and there are like hundreds of golden balloons being released into the sky and oh, wow. probably ending up in some poor sea turtle's throat or something. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> but way but to ruin it. <laughs> the picture itself is is really cool. There's tons of gold balloons being released uh, as his as the hearse is driving away with him in it. That's something I'd like to see a little bit more of, just somebody being so uh, synonymous with like a color of mawashi. We really don't have that right now. Sure, it seems sure. like people are jumping around to different colored mawashis all the time you don't get the i think kota shogiku and that i think that blue the blue that's mm. super iconic yeah there's ura with the pink one yeah, yeah but i think unfortunately mm-hmm. ura is not gonna have be around long enough it's, for that to become it's true but he had a thing going for a yeah. while yeah let's hope they invent invent a better joint tape that can hold him <laughs> intact <laughs> um but yeah so that that uh like i said that about covers uh his in the ring accomplishments but he was probably even more famous for the things he did outside the ring in the hot tub in the hot tub um but he was he was a very un- unconventional guy uh he had a lot more personality than they normally you know are uh encouraged to show in in sumo and we're still not talking about us assure you right nope we are still talking okay. about <laughs> <laughs> um but uh here's here's a quote from john gunning uh he uh John Gunning wrote an excellent uh, obituary um, for uh, for Wajima here. He says, It is one of the great ironies of sumo fandom that while most people love the sport for the pomp and ritual as well as the stoic nature of its combatants, it's the wrestlers with personality who are always the most popular. Whether it's Asashoryu's big mawashi strike or Takami Sakuri's slapping himself into a frenzy before bouts, deviations from the norm are often what generate the most excitement at a tournament. Look no further than former Yokozuna Takanohana for evidence of that. He was absolutely expressionless on the dohyo for virtually all of his 15-year career, but best remembered for one fleeting moment in May 2001 when he let his composure slip after downing Musashi Maru to take the title, despite a serious knee injury that left him barely able to walk. Wajima was in many ways the anti-Takanohana. He lived the celebrity lifestyle, and he loved it. End quote. Cool. So, yeah, some of the, some of the things that he's referring to there... Um, he was the only Yokozuna who never took a Shikona. He was wrestling under his own name, his huh. entire career. He was the only former collegiate competitor to be Yokozuna still to this date, often called the sumo genius because really? of <laughs> no other <laughs> people cow. who have started in college have made it to Yokozuna. Uh, not until Matakiyumi gets there. All right. Mm. <laughs> um, 
But uh, yeah, other ways he tried to be flashy. He uh, before he his hair was long enough to grow a, to tie up in a top knot. He had a nice permed afro. It was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, there's pictures of that. It's excellent. Uh, but when traveling, he liked to drive big foreign cars like he was known for his Lincoln Continental. <laughs> but he, he wasn't driving, correct? Well, he was driven around in okay. nice big foreign cars. He stayed in luxury <laughs> hotels. There are rumors that he associated with people like gangsters and Yakuza. Uh, mm. And he also liked to party late at night, go out drinking with everybody. Uh, he, he was the quintessential celebrity. Rock star. Uh, and the absolutely not quintessential sumo wrestler. <laughs> I'm sure the Japanese Sumo Association loved him. They loved him. Oh, my God. <laughs> you don't even know. No, inform us. <laughs> I, I, it's kind of interesting because, like you said, he was heavily recruited out of the university, right? Oh, yeah. So I, I imagine, like, everyone was kind of trying to, like, uh, try to buy favor from him, like, right from the beginning. I'm willing to bet that people thought he was going to mellow out a little bit mm -hmm. <laughs> and that kind of didn't. <laughs> yeah, but apparently not because he apparently was super good at sumo. So he was super good at sumo. You could say so. Um, <laughs> That's great. That's yeah, great. there this, uh, I, ha I haven't been able to verify this one, but, um, uh, one of the things I came across is that the current Kensho system, that's the, like the envelopes that people give out the special, uh, you know, awards mm -hmm. like that. Um, they, they had to start tying them up because Wajima always made it rain to the audience. <laughs> Stacks. Nothing but you are, <laughs> you are super close. You are super close. Their current system is you get half of it now and you get half of it at retirement because Wajima would always spend it so fast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like I said, money, I, I, I can't find backup sources on that one, but I thought it was too funny to not share. <laughs> Um, but yeah, like I said, eventually the, the injuries caught up with him. Um, he, when he retired, he took over as Oyakata of that same stable that he, uh, worked at or that he trained at his whole career. Um, and this is, this is right away in 1981. Uh, he had already married the eldest daughter of the previous stable master there, uh, former Megashira Onoumi. Um, but Onoumi had reached the mandatory retirement age. So it was time for, uh, him to pass Pass the uh, license on to be the new Oyakata and his daughter and the daughter. <laughs> that is part of the deal in sumo. Um, <laughs> but now here's where things go from like, you know, quirky and fun and uh, unconventional into kind of iffy and, you know, controversial, I guess. Well, you already said Yakuza, so. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so there, there were a lot of criticisms that he lacked leadership qualities um, at and for a time, he didn't even live in the stable, which is definitely not the way you're supposed to do it when you're a coach. Um, Hanakago stable declined for a long time until eventually they didn't have any Makauchi wrestlers left. Um, under Wajima's Under Wajima's watch. watch yeah. Yeah. I was going to say Oyakata-ing, but Oyakata -ing, yeah. Oyakata-ing, yeah. yeah. <laughs> under his Oyakata-ing. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it, the, the final straw here was in 1985. So after four years of coaching, he was pressured to resign because uh, due to the failure of his Chankonabe restaurant, he put up his his uh, share in the Sumo Association as collateral on a loan. Uh, oh. That's a big no-no. <laughs> <laughs> no. Because, if, I mean, potentially if you did that and, like, defaulted on the loan or something like that, then non-Sumo people could buy into the Sumo system, and mm -hmm. that would be a huge pain in the ass for everybody. Yeah, they, they would be there mm. would be panties in bunches left and right. And, <laughs> yeah. Sorry, mowashis and bunches. Mowashis, there you go. Yeah, they'd get uh, like sumo retirement money. Like you could be a judge, and you can like vote on the new chairman, and the whole whole thing as well. Yeah, and if it's up to the highest bidder to buy that share, man, can you imagine like how many companies would want to get in on that? Or mm -hmm. yeah, it, yeah, it would be bad news bears. Yeah, it was a crazy presence of where people can sell those shares, and then you, the outside influences start. Yep, and the the insular nature of this of the world of sumo is part of what helps it stay so steady and so steeped in tradition. So that would have been a big deal. It didn't happen, uh, but they definitely kicked his ass out for this one. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so that was five years after he took over as the Oyakata. Uh, four, but four. yeah. Okay. So 1985, mm -hmm. the stable itself had to fold and uh, its wrestlers were transferred to another stable. Mm. So that was uh, that was the end of his time sad, in sumo for time. quite a while. Um, I'll get I'll get into it in a little bit, but uh, he did not set foot in the Kokugi Con for another twenty four years. Oh, wow. Holy cow! This was a big deal. Yeah. Um, so to pay off some of his debts and all that, and you know, try and find a, a new way to make a living, he turned to pro wrestling. 
Um, yeah, specifically as, to a Mr. Shohei Baba. Ryan, you may know him as Giant Baba. He is a uh, the owner of All Japan Pro Wrestling. Well, it was. He's also passed away. Um, but he was, he was one of the first big deal wrestlers in Japan uh, in, in the pro wrestling scene. Uh, so Giant Baba, uh, who is also a wrestler, uh, convinced him to join the promotion and train at their dojo. And Wajima himself said, Mr. Baba became my boss. Mr. Baba told me, become a man one more time. End quote. I really Ooh. liked that quote. It, 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 <laughs> because this was, this was him like starting a new, like in mm-hmm. sumo, in sumo, when you're a newbie, you, you do, you know, you do chores for, for the elder, the elder wrestlers. Uh, you like wash their backs after practice and things like that. And that was something that he had to start doing again. Like he would, he would be the guy who has to wash giant Baba's back, you know, after their shows and stuff like that. Yeah. He was rough like 37 or 38 at that time. Right. Um, yeah, 1986. So he would be, uh, yeah, in his late, his late thirties. Yeah. Just to give, and coming from such a position of authority and power that that must've really kind of the peak, like the, the absolute top that you can be as far as, you know, pomp and circumstance and, uh, fame and all that. So yeah, it it, definitely a big step, but it was one Mm -hmm. that he wanted to take it. Uh, it helped him. Uh, he says it helped him become like more humble, more, uh, appreciative, and it was a way to use his talents, his athleticism to entertain people and make money again. Uh, because he was a former Yokozuna, he still was obviously very famous, uh, so he was pretty quickly pushed as a superstar. He was also the... He was not the first Yokozuna to turn to pro wrestling, though. Uh, Azuma Fuji in 1955 actually was also a pro wrestler. <laughs> Ooh. Pro wrestling's been going on for quite some time in Japan. Oh yeah, yeah. It, I, I'm, I'm always interested in how two very different cultures in America and Japan both latched onto this one thing, and basically nowhere else in the world on that scale. Mexico has the lucha oh, the libre, lucha, yeah. but yeah, I, I would agree that it's not on the same scale as American and Japanese pro wrestling. Yeah, it, it, it's so funny to me how the one thing, it, and the the product is very similar in the two places, and mm. the appreciation is very similar. But I don't know, it's it's funny. Yeah, yeah. Um, that sounds like a really fun rabbit hole. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so he, he started wrestling uh, about a year after this, so 1986 or so. Um, he, started, he started wrestling often tag teaming with Giant Baba. Um, he would also tag team with the Great Kabuki, uh, another famous name out there. He wrestled against the likes of the Road Warriors. Uh, he once wrestled Ric Flair. Uh, he lost, but he still wrestled him. Uh, he feuded with Stan Hansen. And uh, another name I came across on his record here was Earthquake. Uh, oh, f- another uh, former Rikshi. Yep. Yep. John Tenta, the Canadian who he, I, I think we mentioned, we, we've mentioned a fun him. fact yeah. in mm-hmm. a previous episode. But yeah, he, he tried sumo wrestling before he went into pro wrestling. Um, yeah. During during this career, he also went on a six month tour of the United States. Uh, that's probably where that's probably when he faced Ric Flair. But um, yeah, eventually, though, the the injuries that he accumulated from sumo kind of limited his potential. He ended up retiring after about a two year pro wrestling career at the end of 1988. Uh, his last match, he did tag with the great Kabuki again. Um, but uh, yeah, because of his association with uh, AJPW, All Japan Pro Wrestling, they also didn't really get to use the Kokugi Con for quite a while. <laughs> there was, in fact, there was a, his very first match in Japan what had to be like rescheduled to a different place uh, because they were like, eh, yeah, I don't think we're going to let you in the Kokugi Con. Oh, wow. They really didn't like Wojima. They really didn't like him. <laughs> I mean, he, it was probably one of the bigger uh, scandals in sumo up to that point, at least in like the modern era here. So, so and, and you probably don't know this, but it, they wouldn't let him in the Kokuki Con probably because he put his share up as collateral. They didn't like was him the joining pro wrestling. Both. Okay. Uh, it was definitely both. Um, but have, have uh, they changed their tone on that? Because I know like Ake Bono has gone into pro wrestling, and I don't know like his relationship with. Well, I think I think for this one, it was it was a number of factors, combination of things. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah the 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 collateral on the loan was probably the biggest deal, but it wasn't like they had security guards like on the watch out for Wajima at all times or something. It was like, <laughs> nope, nope, we're not on good terms with you, so like don't just that guy right there. Yeah. Nope, nope, not coming in. Um, but they did, uh, they did eventually, uh, come around, um, you know, in the, in the nineties, the two thousands here, um, he did some other stuff. He coached American football, uh, in Japan. Cool. Another thing that I don't understand why latched on in Japan, but it did. (laughs) It's because American culture loves Japan and Japanese culture loves American culture. It's 
we share a lot of stuff between each other. I, I did actually look this up, and the, the X League in Japan only allows uh, two foreign wrestlers or er, two, uh, two, <laughs> two foreign, foreign really, really? <laughs> <laughs> two uh foreign um football football players. players thank you i almost said wrestlers again <laughs> <laughs> only two uh foreign football players on the field at a time for a given team oh that's funny <laughs> so you can't huh? just like load up with uh you know NCAA Big fat Americans. Yeah. <laughs> NCAA washouts or something like that. Yeah. I, I follow John Gunning's, uh, I think he has a Twitter account, like Inside Japan or Japan Sports, some name like that. And there seems to be a lot of former college football players from America. Really? Like over there, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, other than like the, the Canadian Football League or the Arena Football League, that's well, probably Well, we've got the, the Alliance of hey, American that, Football that just started up. And I'm all about the yeah, Alliance Ryan after and I one watched week. <laughs> the inaugural game. And that was honestly That's why you were really talking awesome. about San Antonio scoring touchdowns. I was Yo, so yeah. confused by that text. I was rooting chat. for San Antonio. <laughs> and we're just continually to dating this episode and make it worse and worse for people to listen to further yes. down the line. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anyways. We're talking about AAF now, right? Yeah. What, what did Let's we go start back to on? That. Go Birmingham yeah. Iron. <laughs> Ooh. Actually did pretty well again in there. Oh, my God. We're going back to Wajima. <laughs> no, let's talk about the commanders and the uh, Birmingham. No, okay, fine. Um, so, yeah, he worked with uh, American football teams in, in Japan. He worked with the Cuban national sumo team. He worked as his home prefecture. Uh, that's Ishikawa. He worked as their tourist ambassador for a while. Uh, in January of 2009, uh, after 24 years, he returned to the Kokugikon for the first time, and he was a guest commentator for a day of sumo. I like to imagine that he just decided, you know what? I'm going to the Kokugikon today. Kick down the doors. Everybody turned around. <gasps> and then they <laughs> Give just. Give that man a microphone. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We've been waiting for you. And uh, so the other thing that was kind of interesting about this, this, uh, this particular rabbit hole I went down to, or I went down, uh, started in the Sumo Forums picture thread. Uh, one of the pallbearers carrying the casket is dressed in ridiculous, like D- w- demon I've caca. That picture. That's I exactly picture. what I'm talking about. Demon yeah. caca. I was like, who the hell is that, and why is he in like Slipknot makeup or something? What or like, it's like is... some combination of Slipknot and Kabuki or whatever. I'll get there. Okay. Um, so I, I this, and he's wearing like some weird crown and some and stuff. No, that's his hair. And I'm, <laughs> is it? How does know. everybody else apparently know about this except I for me? I have no idea how <laughs> Mac and Flair know about this I, guy. I, I've, j- I've seen that picture thread. That's how I know it. Okay. And but the yeah, same it's, thing caught my eye. But I don't know who the guy is at all. Uh, I Demon have, Kagura. I've, yeah. That's now a, currently Demon Kaka. I don't, how do you know this, Mac? <laughs> how do you know this? I have listened to the voice of the demon. And all it right. is good. We're he's not getting he's like a, out of He's him. basically like, a, like an Ozzy Osbourne yeah, exactly. style he's, figure. He's an Japan. Ozzy Osbourne, okay. essentially. He's a, like a, a heavy metal performer. <laughs> and how, how? And he was the like other... I, I, like, I, like, I know a little bit about like heavy metal in Japan with X Japan because I was a big <laughs> fan of them. But I don't know who the heck this I guy is. I expect this from you, Flaric. Yeah. <laughs> this is very surprising for Mac. <laughs> but this, this other guy, this, this guy who is always in character and always has this makeup on in public... He was the other commentator that day when Hajimo was there. So they're like, let's get oh, the two wildest personalities we can that are sumo that are sumo fans and I'll give them microphones, I guess. Let's see what happens. But brilliant. There's some there's some really funny, weird pictures from that. We're going to have to tweet out a lot of these pictures. Yeah, because so. he's like 60 at this time. Wajima is. Mm-hmm. And he's it's, so it's like this old guy that, you know, he's conceivably a former wrestler he's still kind of big but like and then what the hell who is that (laughs) i don't know uh but anyways though uh that was that was his uh triumphant i guess you could say return to the kokugi con for the first time in a quarter century uh so he was he was kind of you know back in the good graces a little bit of the sumo world by then um in 2013 though he was diagnosed with give me a chance uh pharyngeal pharyng cancer uh, cancer oh. of the pharynx. Okay. Mm. I believe. Is, is that the name of the organ? Uh, it's in the throat. The larynx? No, nah, whatever. The thorax? I'm not a doctor. The lorax? I'm not a medical doctor, at <laughs> least. Or any other kind. <laughs> uh, but because, it, because of this cancer and the surgery associated with it, he actually eventually lost his voice entirely. Um, he really put a hamper on his announcing career. It really did. Um, but yeah, eventually he would uh, be conducting interviews by and just like writing down answers and things like that but uh, that's too bad 
but he i mean the last wow. five years or so of his life without the voice he he still uh he had he had difficulty speaking um and was a but he was able to remain physically active uh he would go for like an hour-long walk every day for most of his life um and until and, and hang out in hot tubs and hang out in hot tubs with haku home <laughs> i don't know if that was before or after but it's in there uh but yeah he he passed away at home in tokyo uh october 8th of 2018 at 70 and yeah we, we got to tweet out some pictures from this funeral it was a a, a big deal it was very cool um, but uh, I want to end this one with another quote from John Gunning. Uh, he says, well, Wajima may have had his failings and made his share of mistakes. What he achieved both inside and outside the ring means that with his passing, Sumo has lost one of its all-time great champions, end quote. And that is the Grand Sumo Breakdown version of the 54th Yokozuna Wajima. Uh, I honestly wish that we would have known about him sooner because he seems like a fascinating character and a fun guy to watch in the ring. Yeah, mm-hmm. I'd, I'd never heard of him until I was just browsing Twitter like the day that he passed and saw that yep. he had passed. I like, never heard of this guy, looked him up, and he seemed like, yeah, he had a stellar career, rocketed up the ranks, wasn't around for too long. But yeah, it definitely sounds like he was quite a character in and outside of the ring. Yeah, and a- along the, the lines of his rival, Kitano Umi, who passed away a couple years ago, Oh, and, Kitanumi also passed recently. Yeah, okay. and and Chiyono Fuji uh, also passed relatively recently. These these are names that are are a huge deal, but it it just sucks that uh, you know you you can't be alive forever. You can't know you and and we can't have been fans before we knew about the sport. Really, you know, or so, alive or alive mm. during the times <laughs> that these guys were in their prime. Uh, but like it, it's it's too bad that we can't follow all these very fascinating careers. But. Um, I, I hope to work our way backwards mostly unless there's specific specific news events that cause us to skip around. But um, our, our plan is to cover as many of these recent Yokozuna as we can, uh, whether it's a shorter bonus episode like this one or the inevitable like five part saga on Hakuho and everything. Yeah. You know, but we've got Kisei no Sato <laughs> coming out sometime this year. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, we've got the WWE wrestler Yokozuna that we'll have to cover. Yes, that's very important to cover. <laughs> all, the, all the recent Yokozuna, like yeah. we said. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, man. Well, uh, that's about all I got. Uh, you guys want to wrap things up? Uh, yeah, if you enjoyed this podcast, you can leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast listening service. You can find us on social media, Grand Sumo Breakdown. You can check out our blog, grandsumobreakdown.wordpress.com. I'm going to write an article with uh, some more of our sources and pictures on there. If you have any questions, comments, or corrections, drop us a line at grandsumobreakdown at gmail.com or give us a call at 805-613-7866. That's 805-613-SUMO. All right, we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to Grand Sumo Breakdown. Until next time, throw your salt high and keep moving forward.